Welcome back to the Metzger Collection. This is the second video in our Faces of Jesus series, and today we will be talking about Jesus through our art history. Many aspects of who we understand Jesus to be have stayed the same throughout our history, such as um, his story through the Gospels or um, his place as the Son of God. However, history has taught us that it is easy and sometimes very necessary to focus in on different parts of his identity um, that we consider to be the core. And interestingly enough, these often correspond to our own personal circumstances. Art has provided us a unique window into how artists throughout time have seen Jesus theologically and have chosen to portray him in their pieces. Um, so today we hope to illuminate the theological depth of Jesus' character, but also call us to consider how our own personal circumstances will shape how we see Jesus in our own personal lives, but also where is his place in our world and where is his place in our own lives. So do note, um, I am unable to cover every single piece that was in the exhibit um, because that could probably fill many videos, but nonetheless, I hope you enjoy the selection. Interestingly enough, the earliest depiction of Jesus' crucifixion does not lie within Christian devotional art. Rather, it actually lies in this piece of anti-Christian graffiti. Here we see a man who's presumably Christian kneeling before a donkey-headed crucifixion victim. And below it, the inscription reads, Alex Menos worships his God. In the Roman Empire, crucifixion was the most shameful and abhorred form of death. And, and it was seen to only be distributed to the most unworthy, um, crude criminals. So therefore, it was outrageous and even scandalous that Christians would think of worshiping someone who had died in this way. Of course, Christians were very overt about Jesus' death in the way that they um, talked and the way that they preached, but it's not until about the fourth century that we actually begin to see crucifixion as part of Christian art. It's important to note that most early portrayals of Jesus seek to tell us a specific story of his ministry or uh, expound upon a aspect of Jesus' identity rather than giving us this true likeness which of course has contributed to um, the flurry of confusion that we discussed in the prior video um, in this series. This specific piece was found in the Domitilla Catacombs of Rome and shows Jesus in the center of a group of disciples speaking with authority. Interestingly enough, he is not shown in the garb of a Jewish rabbi with long, a long beard and a prayer shawl. Instead, he is actually shown in the classical garb of philosophers and clean-shaven. This reflects a early enculturation and showing Jesus in a culture that was not his own to allow the Roman audience to understand Jesus' character more effectively. Um, here we also see he is holding a scroll in his left hand and has a, his right hand out in a position that is common to the portraits of famous or orators of his time. Um, but it is a very fascinating piece that effectively establishes um, his character as a great teacher. One of the first themes that um, emerges out of art history is that of Christ being a powerful ruler. We already discussed this idea of Jesus being powerful even within his greatest, weakest moment, the crucifixion, um, which you can see in my top 10 favorite items in the Metzger Collection video. Um, that was part of this exhibit as well. Um, this piece here is the Christ Pantocrator. It is one of the earliest icons, Byzantine icons that we have of Christ and the very first one in the style, also called the ruler of the universe. Um, it is, this, the original is found in St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai, Egypt. This image has um, some special significance here. Symbolism runs very deep as it does often in most icons. This one has a, is actually a split image, so the left side represents Jesus' humanity, his features are softer, um, and the left side, his features are a little bit more harsh, which gives him a um, more intense and transcendent demeanor. Um, here we see in his left side, he is extending a blessing, and he, on his right side, he is um, holding a book which is presumed to be the Gospels. He's clothed in purple to show him as a powerful ruler. 
Um, the overall idea of this not only communicates power, but also gives us the theological insight into the doctrine of Jesus being 100% man as well as 100% divine. The next theme that we're going to explore is quite the opposite of a powerful Christ. The next couple pieces are going to be a humble Christ, one who has sunken himself into the depths of our humanity and is experiencing the suffering and the cruelty of the world alongside with us. Um, this piece, uh, painted by Matthias Grunewald, shows a Christ who has entered into the suffering. He is in extreme agony as he's experiencing the violence and the corruption of our world. Um, despite its very gruesome nature, it is actually one of my favorites from the exhibit because it really identifies and highlights that fact that our own situation has an impact on how we see and how we call out to Christ. Um, this painting was made in the context of a medieval plague, and some of Grunewald's work went into monastic hospitals, where to stand before the painting was actually part of the patient's treatment. Uh, it was primarily in hopes of a miraculous um, healing, but also um, at least if it didn't heal them, then they would know that Christ suffers alongside with them in their darkest hour. Today, we can look at this painting and see how Jesus has humbled himself and brought himself into our suffering as we enter into his. In this piece by Nikolai Gay, Pilate is shown as haughty after he asks his famous question, what is truth? Christ stares back at him in silence with disturbed eyes and unkept hair, and a shaft of light divides the space. The juxtaposition between Pilate and Christ is meant to show the difference between the wisdom of man and the wisdom of the world. Um, unfortunately, um, after this piece was displayed, Nikolai Gay's work was banned from Russia and he was condemned a heretic for showing Christ as less than divinely beautiful. This was seen as being the same as rejecting Jesus' divinity. This was quite the misinterpretation though because what he truly wanted to show was that Christ had shown us the most um, import the importance of the soul um, because he had um, taken on the most insignificant human position possible. The next theme we are exploring is mystical portrayals of Christ. So these focus on the mystery of who Jesus is and his role for the future. This picture shows four panels of one of the most influential and most stolen works in art history, the Gentalter piece. Because it is so rich in symbolism and detail, the artist likely had the advice of a theologian to assist him in putting all these fine details. We're going to take a closer look here um, at each of the four panels. In the top left panel, one encounters Mary, the mother of Jesus, gilded in the rich blues which indicate her role as Queen of Heaven. To the right, John the Baptist appears surrounded by an inscription declaring him a lamp of the world and the witness to the Lord. The figure in the center has drawn much controversy. Some have declared him to be Jesus, based on the trimming of his robe, hailing him the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Others have suggested that he represents a trinity with the three-tiered crown. Some have also claimed him to be God the Father, watching the scene down below. Nevertheless, the figure extends a blessing to the viewer and to humanity. The lower panel depicts the adoration of the mystic lamb, drawing heavily from the Sermon of the Mount and the Book of Revelation, which clearly represents Jesus as the Lamb of God in the setting of New Jerusalem. The Lamb stands on an altar with blood pouring into the Eucharistic chalice from a wounded chest, surrounded by angels and the instruments of the Passion. The twelve disciples kneel beside the Fountain of Life and in front of male martyrs dressed in red. To the left of the Fountain are the patriarchs and the prophets of the Old Testament, and in the distance, female martyrs and the church leaders also come to adore the Lamb of God. This painting is arguably one of the most famous Russian icons to this day. Uh, the artist Andrei Rublev uh, painted it to reflect the story in Genesis 18, where Abraham was visited by three mysterious messengers. Through theological reflection, Andrei Rublev, among others, um, have come to see these three messengers as the Trinity, and he represents that within this painting. Let's take a closer look. As I mentioned before, symbolism is infused into this painting. Each one of the figures is nearly identical to symbolize their oneness, yet there are also distinct features because each one fulfills an individual role. 
Christ in the center wears an earthen robe with a golden band on his right arm to indicate his priesthood. A combination of an earthy brown and a blue sash, like the sky, alludes to Jesus' place as the mediator between the heavens and the earth. The Holy Spirit also wears a blue like the sky, yet he wears a light green of the earth to indicate that all things owe their freshness to his touch. The robes of the Father are dappled with different colors. This suggests that people are unable to confine the Father to mere words. While it is clear that these are heavenly beings because they have wings, each one carries a long walking stick. This has been interpreted to symbolize the way that the Trinity joins each of us in our own journey. The rectangular square beneath the chalice is believed to have once held a mirror in the much larger original, which ref would reflect the observer's face at the table. Overall, the picture opens an invitation to commune with the Trinity as they prepare a table to meet with each of us. The 16th century Reformation saw the emergence of three different orientations towards the purpose of images and to the extent that they were allowed. For Catholics, images were venerated because they represented the divine. They did distinguish between the image object and the image content, um, the image content being the representation of um, so either Jesus, Mary, or a saint, um, and the image object being the physical image itself. And then they, they would address their prayers to the image content. And a good example of the Roman Catholic orientation would be um, that of the Christ Pantocrator or um, Lou Bluff's Trinity, which we discussed just before. For Lutherans, images were allowable as teaching material. They were seen as effective tools to teach people about the doctrines of their faith, as well as the stories that it, um, that it told. An example, a good example of this would be the law and grace relief that I discussed in my top 10 favorite, um, my top 10 favorites video. You're welcome to go watch that if you would like more information about that piece. For reformed Protestants, images were rejected, removed, and destroyed because they were seen as something that could be too easily turned into an idol. Um, this picture here is an effective illustration of this orientation um, as the faces of Jesus and Mary are scratched out. This fresco image was taken from the wall of Grossmünster in Zurich, where um, Zwingli launched the Swiss Reformation, and Swiss Anabaptists who emerged underneath Zwingli, um, or after Zwingli, uh, were often very, very passionate about this issue and were far more destructive towards images in this way. For each contemporary art piece, we will be looking at a specific theme that is present within our own situation. Maximino Carrezzo has been labeled the painter of the liberation, for the common thread of liberation theology and hope evident in his work. He uses his art to identify with the poor and suffering populations of Latin America. This mural is located in Brazil and was painted during a time of intense persecution. The liberation theology is very evident within this work. Here we see Jesus' followers carrying his cross while looking expectantly upon a risen Christ who shares in both their struggles and their hope. This modern icon of Dorothy Day reaching out to the homeless Christ reflects her commitment to live out the words of Jesus in Matthew 25, 40. Truly I tell you, what you did for the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did for me. Dorothy Day was a prominent civil rights activist and journalist during the Great Depression of America and beyond, and she ad advocated for the rights of the marginalized, particularly the homeless and unemployed. Um, this icon calls us to consider how we can see the face of Jesus in the marginalized in our own lives. This dashboard figure from Kevin Smith's film Dogma is um, a parody of a religious icon. In the narrative of the film, Cardinal Glick wanted to up create a more uplifting image of Jesus and renew interest in the Catholic Church. Therefore, he unveils a large statue of Buddy Christ. And this is an image of God who ha who's a friend and has your back and will is there to help you with your troubles. While elements of this perspective certainly resonate with the biblical understanding, um, a an embrace of these elements alone, in addition to uncritically um, taking in an image of Christ from Hollywood, casually represented in the form of a dashboard action figure, may prove to be problematic. So therefore, take it with a grain of salt. This next piece is a um, painting by a Columbia student uh, and it was painted as a reflection on the ways that we can understand and communicate with God today. 
um, and it has lots of really interesting details, so we're going to take a closer look at this one. The unique thing about this piece is that it acknowledges the reality that our view of the face of Christ here and now is obscured, as indicated in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see through glass darkly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know even also as I am known. While what we see now is an incomplete picture of the one who embodies completeness, we can in fact still have a relationship with Christ. One of the ways that we can have a relationship is through reading scripture and reflecting on the life and words of Jesus while he was here on earth, which rep is represented with the torn pages of scripture. One can also know Jesus through coming into contact with the Holy Spirit and the divine mystery and uniqueness of this experience, which is revealed through the abstracted background. Despite the ways that we can connect with Christ, we will only see a glimpse of his character while we walk here on this earth. The full extent of who Jesus is will only be revealed in the new creation. As such, uh, the artist has incorporated naturalistic drawing of Jesus to represent the new depth of relationship which will be accessible in the new creation where we can physically see Jesus and have a conversation face to face. And that is it for today's tour at the Metzger Collection. Don't forget to like, comment, and share this video with your friends and family. And if you haven't already, subscribe to this channel so you don't miss next week's tour on enculturated portrayals of Jesus. See you next week!